Here's a really awesome integral that we're going to evaluate using a couple of my favorite tools. The first one is Euler's wonderful formula, and the second one is an integral representation of the beta function with complex arguments x and y. So without further delay, let's call the integral i. However, there's one small problem that needs to be addressed first. And that problem is due to the limits of integration. And what I'm trying to say is that given my approach, specifically the use of the beta function later, these limits aren't going to help. And that will become clear in a few moments. However, we can get rid of this hurdle by using a transformation from the x to the 1 by x world, whereby dx goes to the negative of 1 by x squared dx. And as far as the limits are concerned, as x approaches 0 from the right, its reciprocal goes to positive infinity. And as x approaches 1, so does its reciprocal. So that means the integral i transforms into the integral from infinity to 1 of the cosine of the natural log of 1 by x divided by 1 by x squared plus 1 times negative 1 by x squared dx. You can get rid of this negative sign here by switching up the limits of integration, making it look less weird. So we have the integral from 1 to infinity of the cosine of the natural log of... And now you can make use of some useful properties of the natural logarithm. Specifically, I'm talking about the fact that the natural log of 1 by x equals the negative of the natural log of x. So you have the cosine of the negative of the natural log of x divided by 1 plus x squared by x squared times 1 by x squared dx. And the x squared terms cancel out quite nicely. And we know that the cosine is an even function, so we can ignore the negative sign. So that means i is the integral from 1 to infinity of the cosine of the natural log of x divided by 1 plus x squared dx. Notice that we started off with the integral of this function evaluated from 0 to 1. And this is equal to the integral of the same function from 1 to infinity. So that means if I add up both the expressions for i, then I get 2 times i being equal to the integral from 0 to 1 plus the integral from 1 to infinity of the cosine of the natural log of x divided by 1 plus x squared dx. So using the properties of the definite integral, we can write this as the integral from 0 to infinity of the cosine of the natural log of x divided by 1 plus x squared dx. And dividing both sides by 2, we understand that i equals half this integral. Okay, now it's time to use Euler's beautiful formula. We know that e to the i x equals the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. Only in this case, we have the cosine of the natural log of x. So e to the i replacing x by the natural log of x, we, we get uh, the cosine of the natural log of x, which is the real part anyway. So let's just take the real part of this exponential. So this is the term that we need. We need the real part of e to the i times the natural log of x. Now, this term on the left-hand side can be written as the real part of e to the natural log of x to the i. And the e and the natural log cancel out, and we're left with the real part of x to the i being equal to the cosine of the natural log of x, which is pretty cool. So all of this implies that i equals one half of the integral from zero to infinity of x to the i divided by, oh, sorry about that, the real part of the integral from zero to infinity of x to the i divided by one plus x squared dx. Now to complete the annihilation of this integral, we just need to make one more substitution. So let x squared equal t which implies that x equals t to the one-half. And this also implies that 2x dx equals dt. So we can write our integral i as one-half of the real part of the integral from 0 to infinity. Now I'm going to write this x to the i as x to the i minus 1 times x 
dx, and all of this is being divided by one by one plus x squared. So I need a factor of two, so let's place it here, then we need a factor of one half outside to balance it out. So in the t world, we have one fourth of the real part of the integral. Now, under our transformation, the limits of integration are clearly not altered. So we have x to the i minus one become, becomes a t to the one half of i minus one times all of this transforms into the differential element dt and we're dividing by one plus t. And now to invoke the cousin of the beta function, uh, of the gamma function, that is the beta function. So the beta function with complex arguments x and y equals the integral from zero to infinity of t to the y minus one divided by one plus t to the x plus y dt. So we can compare the exponents in the numerator and denominator to figure out the arguments x and y. So from the numerators, we see the y minus 1 equals 1 half of i minus 1, which becomes uh, 1 half of i minus 1 half. And if you add 1 on both sides, you have negative 1 half plus 1 equals positive 1 half, right? So this implies the y equals 1 half of 1 plus i. Okay, cool. And to determine x, we note that the... Uh, exponent in the denominator is 1 and according to the beta function x plus y here equals 1 so this implies that x equals 1 minus this value of y which is 1 plus i by 2 and I'm gonna leave it in this form for later okay so this implies that i equals 1 fourth of the real part of the beta function with arguments um, i plus 1 by 2 and 1 minus i plus 1 by 2. Okay, cool. Now, we normally just use the beta function when we want to invoke its relationship with the gamma function, right? So we have one fourth of the real part of the gamma function evaluated at 1 plus i by 2 times gamma 1 minus 1 plus i by 2 divided by the gamma function evaluated at the sum of these arguments. And we notice in the denominator that these two terms cancel out and you're left with gamma 1, which is 0 factorial, which is 1. Okay, cool. So you have 1 fourth of the real part of gamma 1 plus i by 2 times gamma 1 minus 1 plus i by 2, correct? So now you can use that wonderful reflection formula for the gamma function, which states that gamma z times gamma 1 minus z equals pi times the cosecant of pi times z. So all of this implies that i equals 1 fourth of the real part and pi is just a constant, so you can write this as pi by 4 times the real part of the, cose the cosecant of pi times all of this, which becomes pi by 2 plus i times pi by 2. And the cosecant of pi by 2 plus something equals the secant, right? So we have pi by 4 times the real part of the secant of i times pi by 2. And we know that the cosine of i x equals the cosh of x, that is the hyperbolic cosine. So the same relation holds for its multiplicative inverse, that's the secant function. So we have pi by 4 times the real part of the hyperbolic secant of pi by 2, which we know is a real number. So finally, we can conclude that the integral from 0 to 1 of the cosine of the natural log of x divided by 1 plus x squared with respect to x equals pi by 4 times the hyperbolic secant of pi by 2, which is quite a nice result indeed. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.